It's good to be back with you again. Thanks for the opportunity, the invitation to be with you. Thank you for that special music just now and the praise group singing. I always, it's good to see your smiling eyes behind those masks out there and to be with you on this bit of a wet, somewhat rainy Sunday. At least it was raining in Fort Payne a while ago. Uh, mercy drops around us, but for the showers we plead, that is the uh, spiritual showers, of course. I thought about you and pray for you and keep being who you are and keep being faithful unto the Lord as a church as uh, He will lead you and take care of you. As uh, she was reading Psalm, that Psalm a while ago, I, I've been reading through the Psalms for my own personal uh, reading lately and remembered that Psalms 120 through 150 are called in the group called Ascension Psalms or Psalms of Ascent. That is, they were used pretty much in times of worship for the Hebrew people as they were climbing the mountain, going up Mount Zion to the Holy Temple there in Jerusalem. For many of them, only once a year they had the opportunity and for some, just once a year, once a lifetime uh, throughout that area. But they would sing those Psalms from 120 up to about 150 in our Old Testament's uh, songs of the saints. And so that's what, that's what worship is, isn't it? So many times it said in there, those Psalms, read them, praise, praise the Lord. And so it's good to be with you uh, today and to have a time. Now, last time after service, a gentleman said to me, well, I'm, I'm glad that you uh, didn't preach too long today. You gave me plenty of time to get to lunch. Well, I told him a while ago, I'm sorry, but I, I believe I'm going to have to go overboard today because I want to talk about sin. And I can't just talk about sin in 20 minutes or even 30 minutes. No, it's, it's the potter in the clay. Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 6 is our text. Jeremiah 18, 1 through 6, the potter and the clay. And I'll be reading, we'll be noticing it from the New International Version. Just a brief word about Jeremiah, he's known as the weeping prophet, very sensitive individual. Many of the people criticized his message of calling them into repentance and faith again and obedience unto the Lord or else there would be consequences. Some tried to assassinate him. Some threw him into a well or a cistern. He became very, very depressed and wanted to give up, but he didn't. And some have referred to Jeremiah as the most Christ-like figure in the Old Testament. Now remember, please, that a prophet is a proclaimer. That's what the Old Testament word translated to prophesy or a prophet means, to proclaim. Now there were times when prophets would look to the future, depending upon the nation's obedience or not, according to what God promises he would do. But primarily it is to proclaim. And this is something that, that Jeremiah here is proclaiming through his object lesson with the potter in Jeremiah chapter 18, one through six. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it another pot, shaping it seemed best to him. And then the word of the Lord came to me. He said, cannot I do with you Israel as this potter does? He declares the Lord. Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, Israel. As clay is in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, Israel. I think I'll just read a couple of more verses here. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down and destroyed, and if that nation I warned repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. And if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I had intended to do it. 
There was the potter sitting in his frame and turning the wheel with his foot. He had a heap of the prepared clay on one side and a pan of water on the other. Taking a lump of clay in one hand, he put it upon, upon the, the wheel as it rotated. He thrust his thumb down into the center of it and he opened a hole down through the center as he widened and thinned it out, the revolving edges in his hands. From some defect in the clay or because he had taken too little, the potter suddenly changed his mind and crushed that vessel into a shapeless mass of mud. But he kept on. And he formed, formed another matter, another pot or piece of pottery in his hand as seemed good to him to make it. And this is what Jeremiah saw. And this is how Jeremiah learned a great lesson from God. He observed that Israel was as clay in the hand of the divine potter. He saw that God dealt with his people in direct relation to their true character. His intentions for them could be reshaped if they were willing to conform to his will, just as his promises of good could be withdrawn if they refused to hearken to his commandments. God can adjust to a changed situation. If we, his people, if you, his church, are faithful unto him as the kind of people he wants you to be, a blessed people, a caring people, a faithful people, a ministering people, then God can bless you and move you and make you what he wishes you to be. There's a great lesson here, not only for this church or any church, for our nation, but I tell you what, let's take just a few minutes and apply Jeremiah's object lesson to our own individual lives, for we are in God's hands and we are being formed and shaped and molded if we let him, if by faith and commitment, we are as clay in the hand of the divine potter. I like Philippians chapter 1, 6, being confident of this one thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will continue it until the day of Jesus Christ. Be as clay in the hand of the divine potter. Now, what can we say? As the potter made that vessel, so God made us. The Bible says, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into him the breath of life, and man became a living soul. But man in his pride and selfishness and self-created wisdom would pull himself from the hands of the divine potter and cry, I evolved. I'm a product of natural law. I came about only by myself. Man would devise all sorts of theories to convince himself he came into being quite independent of Almighty God. But the only true evidence and the only real record indicates that it's otherwise. Now listen, I don't worry about how God created this world. When you read the uh, creation story, I don't worry about whether he created the world in seven days, seven years, or seven million years. I have my opinion about it all, but the main truth is that God created us in his own image. And the creation story in Genesis is not a lab report. It is not a laboratory report. The scientist, you see, always wants to ask how, how, how did this come about scientifically? But the Hebrew writer who recorded in Genesis the creation account is not concerned about how, but why. Why did God create man in the first place? Why? So that he might have fellowship with him, that he might have someone to love and to be loved back and to bring glory to him through his creation. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he them. Have you ever wondered why God chose the earth? Just a tiny grain of sand on the beach of the universe as his base of operations. Maybe as the potter searches for the perfect clay with which to work, God saw exactly what he needed here. And notice that he did not create man haphazardly, but with a definite plan and purpose. You and I, mankind, was created by God for God and to serve any other purpose is to fail to fulfill our destiny. You see, there's a longing in your heart. There's a craving in my heart and yours for fulfillment, for acceptance, for love, for happiness. David the psalmist cried out in two different psalms, 
One, he said, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. And he also said, as the deer pants after the water brooks, so pants my soul after you, O God. That's a part of being made in the image of God with the capacity to relate to him. And we try to fill this, fill this need and, and this hunger and this vacuum with all sorts of things. Could be somebody else. Could be even family. Or could be material things or, or money or power or prestige. But whether the human heart beats in a body that's darkened by the African sun or the light-skinned body of a Scandinavian or tan frame of the Oriental, it longs, really does, for the divine potter. Now, being made in God's image, again, means we can, we can be rational. We can rationalize. We can think. We can choose. And God created us with the capacity to choose to obedient, obedi obey Him or not. Obedi obedience or disobedience. Right or wrong. Darkness or light. And we know that man made the wrong choice. Man turned his back on God. So as the vessel was marred in the potter's hand, listen to this, God's vessel, mankind, was marred by sin. We can't comprehend this mystery, but we do know that it happened. Man who just a few hours earlier had glorious fellowship with God in perfection now fell into the dark gloom of despair. A flaw had appeared in the masterpiece of God. Man immediately was classified as a transgressor, a, a disobedient child of creation, a sinner, an alien from God. And that means, as the scripture says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Throughout the, wreck the, the his pages of history, we can see the wreckage of sin's devastation. Think about it. There's Cain vanishing into the forest with his innocent brother's blood crying from the ground. They're the wicked people of Noah's day, slipping into judgment. Remember Samson? Samson, the strong man, now blindly and remorsefully turning the mill of his enemies. And King Saul, the first king of Israel, now because of envy and jealousy, falling upon the edge of his own sword. And Jezebel, Queen Jezebel, defiant and unbelieving, cast from the window of her palace for the dogs to eat. And we can judge those folks we can judge those bad people easily. But unless we have been made new, unless we are like clay in the hand of the divine potter, unless we have this, this personal relationship with God through Christ, we're no better than they are. The fall of man into sin has shown one thing, has proven one thing, that our goodness has utterly failed. God gave man liberty and he abused it. God gave man strength and he wasted it. God gave man privilege and he blew it. But what happened in the Garden of Eden is but a preview of what is happening every single day in this drama of life. Now listen, God does not hold you responsible for Adam's sin or anybody else's, only your own. But we live with the consequences of each other's disobedience. But through Christ, a way has been made into the very presence of God. But now as then, we must approach him in the manner in which he prescribes and not our own. As he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. Obedience is still the test of love. And so, as the, divine, as the potter made a new vessel, so the divine potter made a new vessel. Our ruin was complete. Our redemption is more complete. We were utterly lost. We are made completely new through Christ. You see, when you trust Christ as your Savior, and I imagine most of you here have, and when you've invited Him in your life by faith, something different happens inside. A spiritual rebirth. Spiritual rebirth. As the Scripture says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. New, old things are passing away. All things are becoming new. Some people are, have a dramatic conversion, but most of us, it becomes a little more gradual, I think. When I was a child, when I was a boy growing up there in, in South Carolina, I played outside 
almost all the time. You see, we didn't have an internet. We didn't have computers. There's no such thing as a satellite dish. There were no uh, iPads or those computer games that some of you guys play all the time. So I just played outside all of the time. And I can remember, vaguely remember, when the highway department was going to pave our dirt road out there in the country. And everybody was so excited and all the equipment came in and they were, they were leveling off the road and digging the ditches and bringing in topsoil and the, and the dust was flying everywhere and they were about ready to put down the first layer of the primer of tar. Well, I pretend to you that I was a highwayman. And I had several of those little toy dump trucks. And I had what I called an old steam shovel that would dig up dirt in the backyard. And I had a, a road grader or road scraper, just like they had, had out on the real road. And I'd put that dirt out there and I'd smooth it out. And I'd call myself building roads. I'd stay out there all the time. And one day I just finished the longest and best road of my life, of my career. And I would dare anybody to come out and step, step on my road like my sister would do. And one day a friend came to play and he wanted to take one of my little, little toy dump trucks and, and push it down that road. Well, I was told to share, you know. So I let him and he was having a good time. And he was pushing that dump truck down that road. And I looked back at him. And as he was doing that, this foot and this leg and this knee was just dragging all across my perfect road. And he dug up half of it. And it ticked me off. And I was just livid and angry. And I told him to go home. Get out of here. That wasn't right, but I was so mad. He had destroyed my perfect road. But I started over and I stayed out there well past dark. I didn't even come in for supper until they had to call me several times to come in. And I made a, a different road, a better road, a perfect road, even though a flaw appeared in the perfect creation of God. He didn't give up. He didn't give up. You don't read in here, Jeremiah, saying that the potter mended or repaired the vessel? Uh-uh. He didn't, he didn't, he made a new vessel, a perfect one. He didn't take that lump of clay and throw it down. He kept working it and working it. And that's what God has done. And that's what God is doing with you and with me. And you see, it culminated at the cross because the ground is level at the foot of the cross and the cross declares that every man marred by sin must be remade. And so the heavenly potter, through a process which unfolded through the centuries, made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. And Satan, Satan who thought that he had outwitted the Most High God, was defeated at the cross. There's an old hymn that you're probably familiar with. And part of the words are like this. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Let's be still just a second. Would you bow in prayer with me? Would you even perhaps as, as a believer, as a child of God, would say to him, well, Lord, you have my soul, but take my, take my life, take my body, take, take my all, my mind, my, my gifts, every, mold me into being what you want me to be and bring glory to yourself. Thank you, Lord, that you're still working with us, that you save us and you haven't finished with us yet, and you haven't finished with, 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 with this congregation, with this church. And so, O divine potter, bring glory to yourself 
through Christ our Lord. Amen.